right now, I'm going to get the old paramotor uh, out of the garage. Ooh, first I've got to go and fetch some fuel. So I need to try and remember again. I think it's 50 to 1 mix, isn't it? I've got some two-stroke oil. Go and get myself some petrol. I uh, drained all the petrol out of the paramotor before I put it away. You don't want manky petrol in your carburetor. Uh, so I'm going to get some petrol and see if we, we start all right. Fingers crossed the battery's okay. I did. I have had one on charge um, in my office, so, so we should be okay if this battery's flat. Right, see you soon. <laughs> Ten litres, fifty to one. That's uh, ten thousand divided by fifty is two hundred. Two hundred mils of this. Where's that? And that's about there. Okay. I haven't got my measuring jug. Everything's packed away. I think I need a haircut. Oh my god. Wife says I look a twat. She's got a point. So one of the things I'm often asked is, do you need a license to do this paramotoring? Well, the answer to that depends on which country you're in. And I've only got experience of, um, of a few different countries. I mean, I'm from the UK, so I'll tell you a little bit about what needs to be done in the UK. But I first learned to fly in Australia. And in Australia, you have to have a paramotor license. I believe there's two pathways to paramotoring. You've either got to get a paramotor license through the Hang Gliding Federation of Australia, and I believe there's also um, a powered parachute method as well of, of getting uh, a paramotor license. I'm not sure how that happens. But in Australia, uh, you've got to do training, you've got to have a minimum number of hours, you've got to pass written exams, um, and you've got to be checked off for, for so many hours uh, in the air. Um, I think you have to do 10 hours flying in total, if I remember rightly. But anyway, um, that's Australia, so a little bit more regulated. So in the UK, it's different. Uh, so here, at the moment, no paramotor license is needed. It's unregulated. So to fly a single paramotor, I believe below 75 kilograms, I think it is, um, that's the weight of, uh, of your equipment, then there's no license needed. I think above that, you've got to have a micro light license or something similar, I believe. But uh, single occupants say, um, Below 75 kilograms, you don't need any kind of license. Uh, it's currently unregulated. However, the issue then becomes insurance because you do have to have insurance. Um, I'm not sure whether that's legal to have insurance, but I think you're gonna set yourself up for a fall if you don't. So uh, imagine, for example, you come in and have a hard landing, you hit somebody's car, um, or you damage somebody's property, or your paramotor catches fire and burn somebody's house down, I don't know. Or even worse than that, somebody else gets injured due to your paramotoring and you could end up at the, at the wrong end of a, of a legal claim. So insurance uh, is important in the UK and I think most airfields uh, will expect you to have insurance if you fly out of them. 
Now, insurance gets a little bit difficult because you it's getting the insurance. The easiest way to get the insurance is to do the training and to become a member of the uh, BHPA, which is the British version of the HDFA, which is the Hang Gliding Federation of Australia. So if you actually do the training here in the UK, uh, you get insurance through the BHPA. And it's the best kind of insurance because that insurance means you can fly anything and any wing. You can fly anybody else's um, paramotor, you can fly anybody else's wing, provided it's single occupancy and it's below the 75 kilograms. Uh, the alternative is to go for insurance with somebody like AXA. Now, AXA is the only company that I know. There might be others. AXA is a little bit different. So you get insurance, but you are insured for a wing. So you have to give the serial number for the wing and the make, and they will insure you for that. And that means that's all you can fly. So if your mate comes along and wants you to try his wing out, you can't fly it when you're on AXA insurance. You're restricted to the one wing. I think you can add a second wing to it in an additional cost, um, but I'm not 100% sure. So you are, you are limited when it comes to wings. Uh, but if you get AXA insurance, you don't need to do any training or get any kind of license in the UK. Uh, is that recommended? Well, not doing training? Well, that's very debatable. People debate this all the time. Uh, my answer to this is that I would advise anybody to do the training. Now, when I did my training in Australia, particularly the, the, the majority of it, I already knew I was coming back to Europe. And uh, I still chose to go to Brisbane to see Matt Fox and get the training done because I wanted to have that level of training and I knew that the Australian syllabus was quite tight so I wanted to, to know everything that they got to teach. I believe training's uh, imperative. Now, can you fly without training? Absolutely you can. It's not rocket science. You know, you can watch a few YouTube videos and you can figure out how to do it. That's not the issue. Taking off's not that difficult when you're not fat. Uh, Landing is not that difficult. Everybody lands eventually, but, but it's not. The issue comes is what happens when things go wrong. What happens when you hit some turbulence, when you get a wing collapse, um, you know, these kind of things. Um, you know, you get a cravat in the air. What do you do about this? And, and, and what's the best, best way to go around it? Now you can watch videos on this if you want to do, and I guess you can learn if you, if you know the syllabus, but there's no, nothing better than actually getting the training because the instructors know what the issues are for everybody who paramotors. They, they know about the safety, they know about the incident reports, they know about what kills pilots. HGFA, for example, uh, whenever they have a, an incident or an accident with a pilot, uh, th they do a review of it, they do an incident inquiry, and then the lessons, the reflections from that can be fed back to the HGFA members, and that's fed back to the instructors. So the instructors then know, well, we need to work on this particular issue because it's been killing our pilots. So, so I actually think that training's imperative, and yet you don't need to do it, um, you know, it, it, but I would, I would recommend doing it. And people who defend not getting training, well, I, I, I kind of understand, you know, if personally you can't afford to get the training because it can be expensive, or it doesn't suit you, fine, that, that's all well and good. And, and as long as you know the risks, that's great. But I don't believe you should advocate for no training. Uh, I think you should advocate for training, but if you choose not to do it yourself, that's your own affair. So those are the licenses in the uh, UK and in Australia. Spain is very similar to the UK. The only difference between Spain and the UK is um, that the insurance is absolutely imperative. If you get caught without insurance by the Guardia Seville or anybody else there, they'll take your gear. They don't mess around down in Spain when it comes to things like that. So make sure you've got insurance when you're in Spain. Uh, other than that, you don't have to be a member of their paramotor association. I don't know what it's called, um, but you must have insurance. Uh, the United States of America, well, I think you probably already know there's lots of videos about that. In the United States, you don't need formal training. Um, you can fly with, without any training. It's uh, relatively unregulated. I think their uh, version of the Civil Aviation Authority, I forget what they call them off the top of my head now, um, you know, they do monitor the sport. There are rules and laws. Uh, of course, there are in the UK, we do have to follow certain air rules and air laws, uh, but other than that, you don't need a license to fly.
So it seems Australia is the only one that requires a license to fly. Um, it's quite restrictive. I don't think it's a bad thing, but it depends on uh, on your own finances. It, it's a bit of a struggle in Australia because there's not many schools and the place is spread out so thin. So your nearest paramotor school is probably about 3,000 kilometers away. Um, we don't have that issue in the UK. There's, there's likely to be somebody within 50 miles. So anyway, that's it about the licenses. So you didn't tell me, did you? So while I was doing that vlogging, there was a little bit of stray hair wafting around that was about this long that somehow I'd missed. I've managed to get it sheared off now, so I don't look too much of a twat anymore. So the plan was yesterday, while the weather was beautiful, I was gonna spend the morning getting the paramotor running and then towards the evening, about an hour and a half before sunset, I was gonna go down to Winglands uh, and try my luck. Problem is, I had a lot of difficulty trying to get the paramotor started. It had been drained of fuel. Um, it wouldn't prime, it just wouldn't push uh, the fuel through the carburetor. The, I think it was because of the air that was in there. Uh, so I had to strip off the, the air filter off the side, uh, play around with the carb, get the fuel through. And it took me quite a while. It was quite a lot of effort. And the battery was flat as well. I thought I'd left it on charge, but in actual fact, I'd left it connected with the battery charger. But you had to press and hold the button for it to actually start charging. And I'd forgotten it had been that long. Uh, eventually got the battery started, got the paramotor running. Seems a little bit ropey. Um, I asked Dave Messenger, who's a, a Nirvana dealer, what the ideal RPM was for the Nirvana Instinct, and, and he suggested uh, 1200, but says that he prefers himself it to be a little bit lower. I must admit, I had difficulties trying to get it to run smoothly below about 1400 revs per minute. Um, when it got down to 1200, it, it would start to run a little bit rougher and uh, eventually would lose the revs and stall. I, I warmed it up as much as I could do, you know, bench starting it and things, and it didn't seem to improve things a great deal at all. So I had a little play with the, um, the low screw. Uh, I actually turned it in quarter of a turn and it runs a lot smoother. The problem is I don't like the idea of that because the carburetor was set up exactly as the manual says, and that's three quarters of a turn uh, out on the low screw, uh, one whole turn out on the high screw. I don't like going away from those uh, factory standards. Uh, I've done it, but I'm thinking about putting it back. I wonder what you think. Leave me a comment down below what your recommendation is. I didn't know whether just to have a hard day with it, run it, maybe get flying uh, and see how it runs then after it's, uh, you know, it's had about a, an hour's worth of running. Please let me know what your recommendations are. So we eventually got it running. Probably not running quite as smooth as I'd like, but it does start first time, uh, does run, develops power, uh, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't seem to miss or, or chug uh, when you've got full revs. So, so I'm quite happy that it's gonna be okay for flying. Uh, the issue is it's now the next day, and I was planning um, to go to Winglands, but the weather's not been uh, it's quite so nice today. In actual fact, it's quite wet and, and rainy. The, the sky's black, it's a bit more um, uh, blowy. You might see the plants uh, flapping around behind me and things, uh, and it's been spitting rain. So non-ideal conditions for me. So what I have done though, is I've come down to look at another airfield. Uh, this was an airfield uh, that was recommended by uh, a guy called Mike O'Hara. Thank you, Mike, and Bob Shields as well. Hook me up with Mike. Uh, this is down. Um, well, it's in it's in a private location. This actually belongs to a farm, so I don't want to share it right now because I haven't had permission uh, from the landowner to share it. But it's a beautiful big field, uh, and it, this might be ideal for doing a few first flights from. So I've had to get out all the vlogging kit. It's time to shake off um, all the YouTube stuff. It's been put away for quite a while. Charge all the batteries. I've had to charge my Senna headset, charge the camera, uh, charge the GoPro um, for my helmet. And uh, I've even had to set up my old Lemetrix uh, clock that tells me how many subscribers I've had. Uh, 1,450 subscribers so far. Thank you very much. I mean, that's absolutely phenomenal. I can't believe uh, I've actually uh, 
managed to acquire so many supporters and followers. I really do thank you for that. Okay, so it's time for the draw. Here we go. So we open up the website and put in the URL, gather all the comments, and randomly select one. And there we go. Dusty Anno Pilot. There we go, Dusty Anno Pilot. The Paramotor Sock's yours. So uh, let me know if you definitely want it. Send me your address and I'll get it packed off to you. Oh, Dusty Anno Pilot. Hey, Dusty Ann. You've won a Parasock. Congratulations. It's going all the way to Australia. But anyway, thank you very much. Thank you once again to those 1,450 subscribers. Um, uh, that's absolutely amazing. I can't thank you enough. Uh, please give me a thumbs up for this video. Leave a comment down, be down below. I try to answer most of the comments. Um, please subscribe. Uh, I really do appreciate your support. And maybe I'll see you in another video. Until then, bye for now. Fucking useless.